Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, European Marine Board's third Thursday science webinar. Um, uh, my name is Sheila Heymans. Uh, I'm the executive director of the European Marine Board, and I will be your moderator today. Um, I see we have people coming in still, but uh, I think we will start with the introductions and uh, carry on. Um, and, and hopefully people will arrive uh, in due course. Um, okay, let's see. Oops, see, now I've gone too far. Okay, so <clears throat> some housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, please uh, make sure that your name is clearly entered so that when I uh, we see your questions, we can we know who's asking them. If you have questions, please use the Q and A, which should be at the bottom of your screen, um, to ask those questions. Uh, let us also know which organization and country you're from, so that we have some idea of, of who's asking the questions. And I will, you know, uh, once the speaker has spoken, I will give you an overview. Uh, I will I will read out the questions as they come in. If you have any technical issues, use the chat. And please be aware that we are recording and live streaming this event, um, and the recording will be made available on our website and on our YouTube channel, and the links are there. <clears throat> so today, the focus of our science webinar is um, on sea ice ocean interactions, um, and it is linked to um, the science that will be presented in our new upcoming document, Nav Navigating the Future 6, which should come out sometime last, uh, sorry, next year. Um, so uh, we thought we would uh, already start talking about the science that's going into it, and, and I'm really looking forward to, to this talk, which will be today by Dr. David Dacker who is a postdoctoral researcher in climatology at the Royal Meteorological Institute in Belgium. So welcome, David. Um, if you uh, can put on your video and unmute yourself, uh, then I will stop sharing my screen and I will leave it to you um, to give the talk. And I will, as I promised, I will give you a five minute uh, to the end uh, reminder. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, and thank you very much to the EMB uh, team for organizing this uh, this event. I'm very pleased to make this presentation. So I will share my screen. So is it uh, seeable now? Yeah. Okay. Seeable perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm, uh, as Sheila said, I'm a postdoc researcher at the Royal Meteorological Institute of Belgium in the unit of uh, dynamical meteorology and uh, climatology. And uh, I work on uh, causal methods to investigate the interactions between uh, sea ice, ocean, and the atmosphere. And in this presentation, I will focus on sea ice, ocean interactions in the Arctic which is uh, my uh, primary field of uh, expertise. And uh, so my work is done in the framework of the, the, the roadmap uh, project, which is a GPI climate, GPI ocean uh, project. So I will, in this presentation, I will not be very, very specific on a specific study, but I will try to make an overview of uh, uh, sea ice ocean interactions in the Arctic with a particular focus on the influence of uh, the uh, ocean on Arctic sea ice. So much less studied studies have been done on the reverse influence of Arctic sea ice on the ocean, but it's also important. So I will say a few words about, about this. So first, I will talk about recent and future changes in Arctic sea ice. Then we'll see what are the, the main causes of the sea ice loss in the Arctic that we have. Uh, I will talk about the influence, the influence of the ocean on Arctic sea ice and the reverse influence of the Arctic sea ice on the ocean. I will say a few words about uh, causal analysis, recent study that, uh, that we published. And uh, I will also talk about some uh, research gaps in this, um, in this field of sea ice ocean interactions uh, and conclude. So first, uh, in terms of uh, the Arctic, we, we all know, I guess uh, all people who attend this seminar today know that there are strong changes in the, in the Arctic. So there is a strong reduction of the, the Arctic sea ice. What you see here are, are maps on the left of uh, the sea ice cover in, in white, so centered on the North Pole. 
Uh, in March, on the left side, it's March 2020. And on the right side, we have September 2020. Um, so what is uh, less known is that you have a, a strong seasonal cycle. So you have uh, the maximum of uh, sea ice in the Arctic is in, in March at the end of the winter, while the minimum uh, Arctic sea ice area is in uh, September at the end of the summer. Um, so strong uh, differences between the two periods. But you also see that over time, over years, you have a, a reduction, especially in the summer, in September, where you, you can see the difference between the ice cover in, in white here and the median ice edge over uh, the, the period 1981-2010. Uh, in March, it's less pronounced, but you also see uh, some reductions, especially in the, in the Barents Sea. You can also look at it in a slightly different way. On the right side, you see uh, also March and September um, sea ice concentration in the Arctic uh, for average over uh, the last decade. And at the bottom, you see the change between the March and September sea ice concentration from the last decade to the first decade of satellite observations, which began in 1979. Uh, you see that uh, not only you have uh, strong differences in, in, um, in between seasons, but you also have uh, strong regional variations depending on the season. So in March, the loss is mainly concentrated in the, in the Barents Sea, in the Greenland Sea, as well as in the Bering uh, Sea, while in September, as the, the ice cover is much more contracted, uh, the, the losses mainly happen in the, in the surrounding of the Central Arctic with a very strong changes in sea ice concentration. We can also plot the time series of the, the Arctic sea ice area since uh, 1979 to now, and we see a strong decline of about 2 million square kilometers in, uh, in annual mean. Uh, over the more than 40 years of satellite observations. And you also see in red that the, the sea ice area is uh, loss is more pronounced in September compared to winter in, uh, in blue. On the right side, it's also an interesting way to plot uh, the changes in Arctic sea ice area. It's a plot of the seasonal, the mean seasonal uh, cycle for um, four different decades uh, from 1979 to 2018. Uh, and you see that you have, uh, for all month, you have a decrease, in fact, of the sea ice, uh, sea ice area in the Arctic uh, over time. And you see that the difference between the curves is always, uh, is uh, of course, larger in the summer compared to the winter. So the loss is more pronounced in the summer. You also see two strong, uh, two, two specific years, 2007 in uh, light gray and 2012 in uh, dark gray, which are, which are in fact a record uh, minima of Arctic sea ice uh, in the past, in the past years. And you also see in red the, the current year. Uh, which is also very, um, uh, which records a very small uh, sea ice area in, uh, in the winter already. In terms of the future, uh, this is a plot of, from the IPCC of the September active sea ice area, uh, showing the, the CMIP-6 uh, model data. And this is the, uh, the ensemble mean over the different, uh, different models. So in black, you have the historical simulation. So decrease of sea ice area that we talked about. But in different colors, you also see the different scenarios from uh, the uh, SSP scenarios. In light blue, you have the, the less emitting greenhouse gas uh, scenario, while in uh, dark red, you have the strongly emitting uh, SSP scenario. SSP 5, 8.5. So you see that you have a strong difference depending on the greenhouse gas emission scenario that we, we take. So uh, we usually define a practically ice-free Arctic as a, a, an Arctic Ocean that is free of sea ice that, that has less than 1 million square kilometer of sea ice in September. 
And uh, this threshold is uh, passed a bit after 2050 in the case of the strong emission scenario, SSP 5, 8.5. Uh, while in the less emitting scenario, you see that we stabilize the, the, the extent of sea ice area at 2 million square kilometers. So strong dependence on the greenhouse gas emission scenario, even if uh, the Arctic could be almost ice free in summer at least once before 2050. We, we can also not only look at CMIP6 models, but we can also extrapolate the, the observations because we know that there is a strong uh, relationship, uh, strong linear relationship between uh, the air temperature and uh, Arctic sea ice area. So uh, if we do that, we can look at different uh, warming uh, sensitivities and see what's uh, going on with uh, the uh, Arctic sea ice area. And uh, we can have a look. This is the result from, from the, the peer-reviewed paper uh, on the left side for the seasonal cycle with the different uh, warming thresholds. Um, on the right side, you see a summary, a nice summary of uh, this, this result, which shows the different months on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have the, the global warming above the pre-industrial level. And uh, you see that uh, at uh, warming of 1.5, so we are here today, at a warming of 1.5 degrees, uh, you do not have any uh, uh, ice-free Arctic, even in the summer. So it's very close, but it's uh, you still have some, uh, some sea ice in the Arctic. But uh, once we go uh, up uh, to uh, 2 degrees, so between 1.5 and 2 degrees, you see that August and September become uh, become ice free in the Arctic, and uh, you, the number of months that are ice free uh, is of course larger if you increase the warming level. So very de uh, strong dependence of the Arctic sea ice on the warming level. What are the causes of this uh, Arctic sea ice loss? So there are different different causes. The main one is uh, probably the external forcing, so the the anthropogenic global warming. This is a figure of the September sea ice area as a function of the cumulative CO2 emission, so strong negative uh, correlation. Uh, and you also have an effect, a strong effect of uh, internal variability. We can quantify this effect by uh, running the, the same model. So in this case, this was the, the CSM uh, model, uh, the same model with different initial conditions. Uh, so if you do that um, 40, 50 times, you end up with uh, different members. And that's what uh, people uh, using CSM have done here. So you see uh, the different blue curves. Uh, so it's a bit messy, but the, the uh, uh, what we often look at after is the ensemble mean and the spread uh, of uh, this, uh, this ensemble. And so the, the spread gives you an idea of the internal variability. We can not only look at the causes of Arctic sea ice in terms of forcing, but also in terms of processes. Uh, and if we do that, often we classify them as atmospheric or oceanic processes. Um, and uh, so on the left side, it's an example of the great, uh, big great uh, cyclone in 2012, which, uh, which had a big impact because it, it, uh, it had uh, 2012, uh, in September 2012, you had a record low uh, sea ice area in uh, September. And uh, on the right, you have uh, the uh, ocean circulation in, in the Arctic. So that's the focus of this, uh, this uh, presentation here. So we'll focus on this one. Um, so you have three main gates to the Arctic. Um, so the ocean carries a lot of heat, which uh, in the end melts the Arctic. So the, it, there is less in the in the past. There has been uh, um, a lot of focus on this, but it's relatively recent that we really look at the influence of uh, the uh, ocean heat on uh, the Arctic sea ice. Three main gates are the Barents Sea uh, Barents Sea opening, Fram Strait on the Atlantic side, and on the Pacific side, you have the, the Bering Strait. And you have a zoom on the right side of um, the upper ocean temperature in the, in the Norwegian Sea, and you see the, the, the arrows uh, that show the main ocean currents 
uh, that go to the to the Arctic. So it's mainly via the, the Barents Sea opening, as I said, and also the France Strait. So a study from on our aim here showed that uh, first you have a strong, this is the Barents Sea, you have a strong redu reduction in sea ice concentration in the winter. So this is winter because in the summer you have almost no sea ice in, uh, in the Barents Sea. So in the winter, uh, this is the ice edge in 1980 and this is the ice edge in 2015. So uh, retreat of the ice edge over time. And um, the plot, the time series here, show in blue the, the sea ice area in the Barents Sea, the annual mean. And in black, you have the, the winter uh, anomaly of sea ice area in, uh, in the Barents Sea. So it's, it shows that uh, first the, the annual sea ice area in the Barents Sea is strongly driven by the winter uh, sea ice area anomaly. And also, it's uh, strongly anti-correlated to, to the ocean heat transport in at the Barents Sea opening. So in red, this is the heat transport at the Barents Sea opening. Uh, be careful, it's a reversed axis uh, because it's uh, an anti-correlation. So it's just to uh, make the things easier for the, for the reader. Um, and uh, Polyakov uh, later on showed that, indeed, you have this uh, this strong effect of the ocean heat transport uh, on Arctic sea ice in the Barents Sea and Kara Sea, but he also showed that uh, it's uh, there is what he calls Atlantif Atlantification of uh, of the process. So the um, the heat coming from the Atlantic, so the AW here, Atlantic water, is going more and more uh, into the Arctic, and this leads to a strong. Uh, reductions of uh, Arctic sea ice, even in the Laptev Sea and East Siberian Sea, due to this intrusion of uh, ocean heat in the intermediate uh, level of the ocean. Another study, uh, modeling study in this case, showed um, that uh, you have differences in uh, how the sea ice in the Arctic is melted, depending on uh, if um, if the, the heat transport is coming from the Barents Sea opening uh, at the top, the Fram Strait at the center, and Bering Strait at the bottom. And so these maps show the, the correlation between the ocean heat transport at these three different gates and the sea ice uh, concentration over three different time periods. So the first time period, 1990, 2019 here, and then these are two uh, snapshots in the in the future using uh, one of the uh, SSP scenarios, I think. So uh, you see that depending, uh, so so if you correlate the sea ice concentration change to the ocean heat transport at the Barents Sea opening, you see that there is a strong, uh, uh, strong correlation, in fact, in uh, the strong correlation in uh, the Barents Sea, uh, which decreases over time uh, as you have less and less sea ice in the Barents Sea, but uh, it extends uh, more in the Laptev and East Siberian seas. So this illustrates well the, the Atlantification process that Polyakov showed uh, before. Uh, Frame State also has a, a big effect in uh, the Atlantic part of the Arctic sea ice, of course but lower than the Barents Sea opening, usually. And uh, the most surprising, I would say, is the effect of the Bering Strait ocean heat transport. So this is a very small strait, and the, uh, the contribution from uh, the Bering, Bering Strait in terms of ocean heat transport is relatively low compared to uh, the Barents Sea opening, for example. But uh, its efficiency is very high because the Pacific water there is uh, relatively, uh, the Bering Strait is, is relatively shallow. So the water stays relatively close to the surface. And also it's uh, less, uh, much less saline than uh, the Atlantic, Atlantic water. So um, here you see a relatively strong effect in the, in the Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea. Uh, but over time, you also see that this effect increases and it reaches the central Arctic. So very strong effect of the Bering Strait ocean heat transport on Arctic sea ice. 
So this uh, map uh, here on the left side uh, summarizes a bit the, the, the findings of the previous studies that I showed you. And uh, on the right side, you have a table from another study looking at different CMIP6 models where they look at the ice edge uh, latitude and they look also at the, the, the maximum uh, correlation between oceanic transport at different latitudes and the uh, ice edge uh, latitude. And you see that the, the, the this maximum correlation is relatively large for the majority of the CMIP6 models here. So this illustrates well the, the, the strong uh, uh, relationship between ocean heat transport and Arctic sea ice. In, uh, so the, the map on the left side shows the, the main straits, huh, the main gates to the Arctic, the Barents Sea opening, the Fram Strait, and the Bering Strait. In a study that we uh, did, that we did relatively recently, we look we looked at the change in uh, March Arctic sea ice volume as a function of the change in ocean heat transport. Uh, doing two types of experiments, so we increased in one experiment. So these are the the, the dots here what we call the Atlantic experiments. In these experiments, we increased the SST in uh, the North Atlantic. And for the, the Pacific experiments, what you see as uh, crosses, so the crosses here, um, we increased the SST in the, in the North Pacific. Um, and so one interesting result of this study is that uh, uh, for the same change in uh, ocean heat transport, when the SST is increased in the Pacific, uh, you see that the change in March, March Arctic sea ice volume, this is also valid for sea ice area, this change in sea ice volume is larger uh, in the Pacific experiment compared to the Atlantic experiments. So we found that this is partly done, partly due to uh, the, the fact that the Pacific, uh, the, the Bering Strait, uh, that's what we explained before, uh, the Pacific water is much uh, less saline than uh, the Atlantic. So the water stays closer uh, to, the, to the surface and uh, there is more potential to eat the Arctic sea ice, in fact, from the Pacific side. Um, but we also found an interesting uh, atmospheric bridge, in fact, between the North Pacific and the North Atlantic. So in an experiment here on the left side where we increase the SST in the North Atlantic, you have a strong, so these maps show the net surface heat flux. So it's positive uh, downwards. So blue values, blue means that you have a neat loss. Um, so we increase the SST in the North Atlantic in this experiment. So you have a strong heat loss in this region. This is logical, but you see that you have almost no effect on the North uh, in the North Pacific region here. On the contrary, when we increase the SST on the Pacific side here, uh, strong heat loss in the Pacific, of course, but you also see a, um, you also see a strong uh, increase in, a, in net surface heat flux in the North Atlantic. So we think that's one of the reasons why you have uh, stronger uh, ocean heat transport in um, in the uh, you have a strong ocean heat transport also at the Barents Sea opening and Fram Strait in these experiments because the net surface heat flux increases a lot in these experiments. And this is illustrated by this uh, plot showing the relationship between the, the Atlantic, the change in Atlantic Ocean transport and the change in uh, net surface heat flux in the Atlantic. So in the case of the Pacific experiments, the crosses, you see a beautiful and a relatively strong uh, relationship between, uh, between these two. So, and I forgot to precise that this was done with uh, the EC Earth East Earth model. In terms of the influence mm -hmm. of the AMOC, so we leave the influence from uh, the, the ocean, the, the ocean heat transport on Arctic sea ice, but rather look at the influence of the AMOC on Arctic sea ice, so the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, uh, which is, uh, so you probably all know this, uh, this uh, picture on the left, uh, left side. On the, on the right side, this is the, one of the results of a study done by Liu et al, uh, where uh, they, they used the, the CCM4 model 
in green, you have uh, the uh, historical combined with RCP 8.5 model. Um, so this is the this is one of the this is the most emitting scenario uh, from the last uh, CMIP5 uh, models. And uh, so you have a decrease of March Arctic sea ice area over time, of course. And they did another experiment where they fixed uh, the AMOC uh, because we know that uh, in this green experiment, in this historical and RCP 8.5 uh, scenario, you have a slowdown of the AMOC over time due to the increase of uh, ocean temperature and to the release of uh, fresh water coming from Arctic sea ice and Greenland ice sheet. Um, so they did another experiment where they tried to fix the AMOC by removing the fresh water in the subpolar North Atlantic. Uh, so when they do that, they see that the, the, as the AMOC stays relatively strong, the reduction in Arctic sea ice is uh, larger. So in some way, uh, the slowdown of the AMOC, uh, what we see in, in green, uh, the slowdown of the AMOC uh, reduces uh, the loss of Arctic sea ice over time. So this is kind of negative uh, feedback. The other way around, the Arctic sea ice also influences the, the ocean. There have been some studies about it, less than the other influence that I talked about before. But there have been, nevertheless, some, some studies. And this one has been done with the FESOM uh, model uh, from the AWI in Germany. And they looked, um, they, they, they did a series of experiments with them, this model. And they, they, they saw that uh, you had um, a feedback between the, the sea ice and the ocean and that the sea ice in the Arctic had a relatively strong influence on, uh, on the ocean, in fact. So they showed that the, you, following the decline in sea ice area, you have a reduced uh, ice export at the Fram Strait, which increases the salinity in the Greenland Sea, which lowers the sea surface heights uh, in the Nordic Sea. And you also have, a, following that, a stronger gyre in the Nordic Seas. Uh, so increased um, influx inflow from Atlantic water coming from uh, the, the Atlantic through Pram Strait, and and so uh, an increased oceanic transport at the at the Fram Strait. So in this case, the the sea ice in the Arctic has a, an impact on uh, on the ocean. Another way uh, to look at this influence of uh, sea ice on the ocean is, of course, to look at um, the, the uh, AMOC. Uh, so this is a figure coming from the last IPCC report. This is the situation of today. So in terms of the AMOC, you have this uh, warm uh, water at the surface of the North Atlantic, uh, the Gulf Stream, which uh, goes to the North Atlantic and, uh, and uh, further, further north. Uh, as the water becomes uh, warmer, uh, as, as the water becomes sorry becomes um, colder, it uh, sinks to the to the bottom of the of the Atlantic, and you have this uh, blue uh, blue current going uh, south. So this is the current situation. In a warmer world, what is uh, projected is a reduction of this AMOC via the uh, the, the the influx of uh, fresh water coming from the the, the sea ice loss in the Arctic, but also ice loss from the Greenland ice sheet. So more fresh water into the ocean, uh, more stratification, and so less uh, less sinking of the water into the deep, uh, deep uh, Atlantic Ocean. So overall, the AMOC is uh, projected to slow down in the future, even if there are many uncertainties related to the, um, the strength of this uh, reduction in the future. We also did uh, a study recently with uh, Stefan uh, Van Itzen at uh, the RMI, where we looked at the two-way causal links between Arctic sea ice and different variables in the ocean and the atmosphere. We used the EC Earth uh, 3 model, um, uh, which couples the ocean and the atmosphere. And um, we, uh, we used uh, a method um, 
to quantify the causal relationships between uh, different variables and uh, CI seria in Dirac. And what we show here, let's first look at the matrix on the right side. This is the correlation coefficient between all the different variables that we, we looked at. Uh, MSIA is March CI's area. Um, so if we look, for example, at this pixel here, this is the correlation between the SST, the sea surface temperature, and the March CI's area over the time, time series that we analyzed. So it's from 1970 to uh, the end of the 21st century. We see negative uh, negative uh, correlation, which is uh, significant at the five percent level. So a strong uh, negative uh, correlation. But we we can also look at the as you as you uh, all know, correlation does not uh, necessarily mean causation. Uh, so it's important to use this uh, kind of causal method to really try to understand if there is a causal relationship between these uh, variables. That's what we did. And uh, when we look, uh, when we reproduce the same uh, matrix, but uh, for the, the causal influences, you have um, first an interesting thing, an absence of, uh, an absence of uh, symmetry. Uh, so for example, if we look at uh, influence from SST to March CI Syria, we have uh, this value of uh, above uh, 5%. And the reverse influence from March CI Syria to SST um, is uh, 9%. So you don't have the same value. First information. And uh, second information is that uh, you can have cases where you have a significant uh, correlation. Like in this case, you have a positive correlation between the atmospheric heat transport and the March CI Syria, while you do not have any significant influence from the atmospheric heat transport to March CI Syria. Uh, and we found in the study that uh, you have a relatively strong influence of the air temperature, the SST, and the ocean heat transport on uh, Arctic CI Syria. And you also have uh, some differences depending on the region, on the season that you look at. So March, March or September. So I will, I will finish with the different examples of research gaps uh, in this uh, field. So it's probably not exhaustive. If, if you ask another researcher, you would probably end up with uh, other answers. But these are things that I think are important uh, in, terms of, uh, the, in terms of the research gaps in these uh, interactions between the sea ice and the ocean. I think there is a need to improve the observations. Uh, there are large uncertainties, for example, in sea ice thickness uh, coming from satellites. And uh, so there is a need to, to have better observations of uh, sea ice thickness in particular. Uh, better understanding, of course, of the pathways of uh, ocean heat that enter the Arctic is also, also ne needed to better quantify the risks of uh, large amounts of uh, warm water going to the Arctic. Uh David, I think we've uh, got five minutes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And there is also a need to improve the, the climate models that are very useful to understand uh, not only the processes, uh, but also the future projections. So there is a need to have more realistic uh, description of ocean current system. This does not mean that the models uh, cannot represent the ocean system, but uh, there is uh, probably a need to, to um, to understand the fine scale uh, details. So a finer model resolution uh, is probably essential in this respect. And um, also a combination, I think, a combination of three different approaches in the modeling world is probably needed. Um, so multimodal uh, comparison is always useful, like the CMIP6, uh, CMIP6, CMIP5 efforts, um, combined with a series of sensitivity experiments, which are also very useful to understand uh, what happens between sea ice and the ocean, and also uh, to take into account the effect of internal variability during uh, large model ensemble simulations. Um, there is also a need uh, to emphasize probably a bit more on regions uh, that are less studies, 
for example, the Pacific side compared to the Atlantic side. Uh, so are there few, there are some studies, uh, but uh, generally we think that Pacific side has, does not have much influence on the Arctic, but as I showed, uh, and other people showed, uh, the Pacific uh, efficiency is relatively large at melting Arctic sea ice. So it's import, important to also consider this. And uh, there is also um, the uh, a need to have more emphasis on uh, processes that are less studies, uh, for example, the influence of sea ice on the ocean. And uh, finally, a need to improve the techniques to uh, evaluate observations and models, and also to compare observations and models. And um, I show, for example, uh, the use of a causal method. And uh, so this is what is represented here, the causal relationships between different elements of the climate system. system. And uh, so there is a need to have this, uh, these uh, methods to better understand the interactions between the different climate components. So I will uh, just show you this uh, last uh, slide summarizing what I said uh, in this presentation. Um, so large decrease of Arctic sea ice uh, the past years, which is due to both uh, anthropogenic global warming and internal variability. We saw that there was a major influence of oceanic transport on the sea ice in the Arctic, also an influence of the EMOC on Arctic sea ice. Um, and also, uh, conversely, the Arctic sea ice has a, uh, an important influence on the ocean. And uh, there is a need, uh, as uh, we saw, to improve uh, observations, models, techniques to analyze both. And also, uh, probably a focus uh, on uh, less, studies, less studied regions and processes. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm pleased to take your questions. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, uh, maybe don't close, don't don't stop sharing because I think the very first question will probably okay. need to go back to the slides. Okay. So our first question is by Natalia Dunik. Hi, Natalia. Nice to see you. She is one of our um, previous young ambassadors. Nice, nice to see you again, or nice to not see you anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, she says, very nice presentation, and she has one question, which was also my question. What method did you use to determine the causa uh, causation uh, ma matrix in, uh, the, you know, the two matrices? The one on the left, how did you do it? That was okay. my question, and I think that's what she's asking. Yeah, so this is done uh, using the Lian Kliman information flow method. Uh, which look at, um, uh, so we compute the rate of information transfer from uh, one variable to the other, uh, taking, taking into account the influence of uh, other, uh, other variables. So this comes from the uh, information uh, theory, in fact. So this can is you, based- can you give the name again? I didn't catch it. So this is the Liang Kliman information flow method. Uh, maybe you can write it in the chat because <laughs> it would be quite helpful for people to know what, what the method uh, is. Yes, I yeah. need to. Um, yeah, that was also my question because I could understand the, the correlation, but I, I didn't quite know how you how you got to the to the causal causal um I cannot access the oh, for some no. reason I need to unshare <laughs> if I yeah, yeah. You can probably unshare now. I think that should probably be fine. Yeah. So you you spell it L I A N G. This is developed. This is a method that was developed by uh, San Liang in uh, in China. Ah, yeah. And uh, this is very useful uh, to to look at this uh, this uh, causal uh, influences between uh, between variables. Um, yeah. And uh, so the, the the metric shows so. Combined to this uh, to this metric, you need to perform a statistical uh, tests to test the significance mm -hmm. of the influence. So, if the value is uh, larger, um, is uh, the absolute value is larger than uh, zero, then you have a significant influence. And if it's significantly not different from zero, you do not have any uh, influence between the the variables. And and uh, while while we've got it up, I, I think we're getting very technical here, but. How can the the values between, you know, in the in the in the on the on the um, horizontal be 
not the same. So between, say, sea surface temperature and sea surface temperature is not the same as between um, MSI and MSI. Because if there's causality, if you're testing causality, are you saying that sea surface doesn't have an impact on sea surface as much as, say, temperature at two meters have a temperature on temperature at two meters? Is that what this graphic says? Ah, yes. So you are talking about the di diagonal here. The diagonal. Yes, side. yes. Yeah. On the diagonal, so this is the self-influence. Uh, using this, uh, yes, this this will always be the the largest uh, largest influence. But in most cases, that's mm -hmm. what we found that you always have a very large value of uh, influences because you have, a, I guess, in some way you have a recording. So this is a you have a stronger correlation. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, but but why is it stronger in some than in others? I think that yeah, this is a good question. I don't know. This is a good question for SST, for example. Much uh, yes, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, that was was one of those odd things that maybe yeah. we need to read the papers to figure it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I but I think have... to, to jump on that question, I think the most yeah this this information is interesting. But I think what is really uh, interesting with this method is to look at the. Yeah. Non self influence, yeah. of, yeah, of course, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Um, so I had a question about the different um entrances to the Arctic and some of the some of the experiments you did. Um, did, did you was it looked like you were looking at only one or the other, but did you ever look at if you combined them? So if you if you combine the it, because I'm assuming that. The, the heat isn't just coming from one side or the other. So yes, yeah. the heat coming from the Bering Sea is is a lot, but um, what is it? How does it combine with say the heat coming through the Fram Strait or something? Have you looked at those interactions? Are you talking more specifically about these experiments that you I are, done? or the? I think previous you had others as well that that uh, yeah, even this one actually the one that that one as well. You kind of have the three different ones, but what yeah. happened? You combine them. That's the thing. Yeah. That. So that was not done by me. I, yeah. <laughs> Jacob Do, Do yeah. et al. Yeah. Um, using the CSM model. Um, yes. In those, uh, yeah, they do not. I don't know if yeah. they have, uh, if they have looked at the combination. Uh, but here in this case, it's only so the upper panels. It shows the the correlation between yeah. uh, ocean heat transport at the Barents Sea opening. So it's. Mm -hmm. uh, only one uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. one uh, quantity, uh, one time series mm -hmm. um, correlation between this uh, oceanic transport at the Barents Sea opening and every and sea ice concentration in each each uh, grid yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so right. of course it will always be larger close to the Barents Sea opening. Yeah. Uh, but what is interesting is to see that uh, how it spreads uh, yeah. over time in the future. But, but for instance, if you look at that graphic, and I mean, you don't have, to, well, there is no answer because you didn't do yes. that. But if you look at that graphic, for instance, um, if you had to compare the Bering Sea opening and the Fram Strait, in the Fram Strait, there seems to be a decrease yep. in the top there. So, so you know, how would those two things work on top of each other? And that's, I guess, it would, maybe that's just a, another research question that needs to be tested. Yes, yes, that's a good question. The, yeah. uh, this, I, yeah, I couldn't. Not, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know how to answer this, but uh, it's it's a good yeah. question. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, but the correlations, yeah, they are negative, but uh, they're relatively weak. Yeah. Also, so yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, and then I also have a question uh, from Paula, one of our um, science officers yeah. here. Um, she said. She's got two sort of related questions. The first one, let me remove it here so I can read it well. Um, where does the data uh, uh, for the modeling come from? So do, do the, the models, are they validated by sort of satellite or in-situ data, research data, Heinkast data? Um, and um, do we have sufficient data coverage in all the areas? Mm -hmm. And then also on, um, a, a link to that, are the models uh adaptable for increasing and uh, um and sort of unprecedented changes in the arctic so first of all where do the data come from i think you mentioned it in your recommendations that we need more models more data but also um 
you know, do we have enough no, data think, in all the areas, yeah. first of all? Yeah. yeah. I don't think we need more models or more data. Uh, pro obs observations, yes, probably yeah. more, more observational data about some uh, some processes, but also we need a longer time series, in fact. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in terms of models, I do not think we especially need more models, but we need to improve the models that we have, yeah. uh, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, uh, where, where do they yeah. come from? These yeah, models, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the data that's used yeah. in, in, in here, are they mainly satellite data or do you use in situ? It depends. I, I always put on the, I don't know if you noticed on the upper right panel, I always put if it's whether, if it comes from observations or a specific yeah. model or different yeah. Uh, yeah. models. Yeah. So it's usually, in terms of models, it's usually uh, CMIP6 uh, models. Uh, yeah. That I showed here. So this is these are the models that uh, that uh, inform the uh, IPCC uh, report. In fact, so these are the the state of the art uh, global climate models. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And this this presentation does not include uh, regional climate models, which mm -hmm. also I'm much less expert in that in that uh, field. But these also provide very interesting information, I think, for the Arctic. And this is also, uh, I've seen uh, some presentations about these uh, regional, regional models, and they also provide very interesting details. Uh, so they, they probably miss some, uh, some processes because they need to be forced by a global climate model. So at the boundary, it's probably less... Uh, uh, less uh, realistic, but uh, they they um, they are much finer in terms of resolution. So they provide another very interesting information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in terms of uh, the other part of the question was uh, the need yeah. of uh, yeah. uh, observations. The, the, yeah, the, the other part of the question was really, do you think the models are able to to make predictions with the with the very increasing and unprecedented changes that we're seeing? You know, there's the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. The unknown unknowns here is, you know, what is going to happen and do I, are, are the models actually able to predict that? Yeah, in the case of uh, Arctic sea ice area, um, well, I think, uh, first of all, when you, the good news is that when you when you take the, the average, in fact, of all uh, CMIP, uh, CMIP models, mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of Arctic sea ice area, uh, you have values that are very close, in fact, than, than the relatively close to the observed uh, mm -hmm. observed value. So the models in some way can, uh, if you average them, uh, you end up with quantities that are, that are reasonable. So we start, in some way, we start from a, a good, good uh, starting point, I would say. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of projections, of course, depending on the scenario that we, we follow, it um, it can be uh, you can have uh, large uh, large differences. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the the best until now probably the the best approach is probably like in this figure it's the ensemble mean mm -hmm. ensemble mean um, uh, the, the the ensemble mean that is showed. Yeah. Um, and I think it probably it's probably the best information in terms of the the future projections. Now there are many uh, studies that are trying to uh, improve these uh, projections by uh, taking a weighted uh, model average, mm -hmm. uh, putting more weight to some models that are better at representing some specific processes than others. For mm -hmm. example, uh, and this is also something that we did in our previous studies. Uh, when doing that, we see that if we take only the models that are good at representing the specific process that we are interested in, then we end up with, a, unfortunately, a nice free Arctic that is uh, earlier uh, mm -hmm. than expected. Um, so there are, I think now there are techniques, there are techniques that are developed to try to improve this uh, these uh, projections in the future, um, but also um, uh, a need to go to uh, finer uh, resolutions in uh, some uh, specific uh, uh, models. In this respect, I think uh, the FESOM model, which I mentioned in the end of my presentation, is probably an interesting model. It's a, uh, a model that has a 
horizontal grid size that varies depending on the region. So you can focus on some uh, specific uh, regions with more accuracy compared to the to, to mm -hmm. other regions. So that allows you not to have a very fine resolution everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, which saves a lot of uh, computing time. In fact, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and then I have, I don't know if they, there doesn't seem to be any other questions. I have another question that, that blew my head about, off a bit. Um, it was about the AMOC. You showed the bit uh, yeah. about the AMOC slow down. And if it didn't slow down, then the ice loss would be even worse. Why? Yeah, be, because, uh, no, 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 no. The re so if it slows down in uh, the case... Um, it's, it's what's the green line, right? It's the, yeah. it's the green yeah. line. Yeah. If, if it slows down, then you have uh, less, as the amok, as the, as the amok is, uh, is uh, you have less heat from the ocean that goes into the, into the Arctic. Uh, and yeah. so you have, uh, you have a lower reduction of uh, sea ice area, in fact, you have less melting of sea ice because less input of ocean heat. Um, yes, but but purple line. And the purple line is where you fix the amok. So you, you remove some uh, fresh water, you yeah. remove fresh water from the system. Yeah. It's uh, becoming more saline. Yeah. And so you have more, the amok, the amok is, uh, the amok stays fixed, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, like in this in this picture, it stays mm -hmm. it stays this way. So it means that you have more uh, more uh, you have constant ocean heat to the Arctic. So it's melting at the same same rate. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, so, that makes sense. All right. Yeah. So yeah, in, in fact, good. it's much more complicated than this. Huh? But uh, yeah. in this experiment, they just wanted to isolate the impact of uh, the AMOC. Yeah. And see what happens if they uh, if they um, slow down the AMOC, mm -hmm. and the slowdown of the AMOC here is represented by what's happening. It's the green yeah. green curve. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you have uh, a loss that is lower. Yeah. Of, uh, Arctic sea ice yeah. in this case. Okay. Thanks. No, I I just I wasn't following in, in fast enough there. And then we have finally one. Um, Last question from uh, Ovent Lundeshardt from the Norwegian Polar Institute. He said, he's thank you very much um, uh, for, for the talk. And uh, he said, since you are working with these large scale ESMs, Earth System Models, I suppose, yeah. can you say something about how well you think physical processes in the Arctic Ocean, uh, which are often quite small scale, are represented in these models in general? And are there some processes that are particularly tricky to capture or things that the models consistently fail to get right? It's a great question of it. Yeah, I think, yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, probably. They, I don't think, I don't think they, they fail. But uh, as I said, there is a, a need to improve the climate models and the exact uh, pathways by which the ocean, by which the ocean uh, heats uh, the Arctic sea ice. Um, so the, there is usually, um, in fact, a big focus. There is a big focus on uh, how the Arctic sea ice as a global quantity is affected by the heat from the Atlantic or the Pacific, mm -hmm. but um, much less focus on specific, uh, specific regions and specific processes. Uh, so I think there is probably a need to improve the, what happens, for example. There have been a lot of studies in the Barents Sea uh, because in the Barents Sea, they, they've been asked, uh, the person who asked the questions probably knows, a uh, mm -hmm. lot of um, changes in the Arctic, in, uh, mm -hmm. in the Barents Sea in the winter. Uh, but we know probably less about uh, specific processes of ocean heat influencing the, uh, the other seas of the Arctic. And this is also um, very important, I think, because uh, in the future, we might get uh, regions that resemble more and more the, the Barents Sea, in fact, mm -hmm. with uh, no sea ice in the September and uh, a strong reduction in the in the winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of processes, yes, there are many yeah, in terms of the ocean, but also in terms of sea ice and the sea ice, in the sea ice models, uh, the, the different uh, fine scale processes uh also um there is a need to to uh, understand 
better and better all these uh, these uh, processes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, David. I think we're uh, nearly at the time. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so if you you can probably stop sharing your screen now. Um, and uh, thank you very much again. It was it was really interesting. I I learned a lot, and it was thank good to, to think about these things, although scary, but <laughs> but good to think about these. Um, so I think that there's only one more thing to do, and that is if I can just make sure I share the right screen. That is just to say that, uh, to thank David again, and to say that our next um, talk will be next uh, month on the 16th of March, uh, the next webinar. And we will have our two young ambassadors, Rebecca Zetone and Adiani Gopakumar, uh, who will give us a, a talk about the Young Ambassador Program and, and uh, what how they've experienced it. So um, I will say that please join us next month for those talks. And again, thank you very much, David. It was a very, very interesting talk. And I, I look forward to, um, to seeing how this uh, pans out in the, in the Navigate the Future 6 document. So 